All right, hello everyone. My name is Lorraine Proventure. I'm just finishing up my glaucoma fellowship at the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center. And I spent a large portion of the last year learning intraoperative gonioscopy and MIGS. And I hope that I can pass on some helpful tips and tricks over the next hour that I've learned along the way this year. The outline for today will include two parts. The first being intraoperative gonioscopy. We'll go over principles, implementation, and troubleshooting. And then we will move on quick to quickly review some MIGS basics before delving into a few of my favorite MIGS that I feel are most appropriate for a global audience. But I do want to start um, with some poll questions to get to know the audience a little bit. So if you could just tell me what your current level of training is. Are you a resident, a fellow? Do you consider yourself a young surgeon or an experienced surgeon? Or do you fall into some other category? Maybe you're an optometrist or a support staff or a scrub nurse. Okay, it looks like we have a nice mixture, some residents, some fellows and young surgeons, and then also some experienced surgeons. That's great. We'll go to one more poll question here. What is your experience with intraoperative gonioscopy in particular? Have you never tried it or observed it live? Have you observed it but not tried it yourself? Or maybe you've tried a few cases but you're still uncomfortable learning or having some difficulty? Or do you consider yourself proficient but you could be better? Or maybe you're skilled and you could teach it. Okay, it looks like we have a nice mixture again. Most people have never tried it or observed it. Some have observed it but um, have not tried it themselves. That's about 60% of the audience. And then the rest, the, the more skilled and we don't have many of those people here. So this is gonna be a perfect talk for this audience. So intraoperative gonioscopy is truly the foundation of MIGS. Everything surgical that you will do, do is built upon your skill as a gonioscopist. I think that obtaining and maintaining an adequate view is one of the most difficult hurdles when it comes to learning these procedures. As we all know, light from the iridocorneal angle undergoes total internal reflection at the air, air tear film interface, hence the need for gonioscopy when it comes to viewing the angle. There are two basic types of gonioscopy and therefore two types of gonio lenses, the direct and indirect lens. Direct lenses change the angle of light's interface with air so that the light from the trabecular meshwork exits more perpendicularly. And until the MIGS revolution, direct gonioscopy was reserved mostly for peds glaucoma during exam under anesthesia or for goniotomy. And outside of the OR, we really don't use it much as it's impractical in clinic. It requires a coupling agent, it requires a portable slit lamp, and the patient has to be supine. But direct gonioscopy has really made a major comeback with MIGS. So I have many tips on how to get started. Some of these details may seem small or simple, but if done incorrectly, they can make an easy case seem very difficult or even possible to complete safely. Success starts in the clinic with proper patient selection. For direct gonio, you will need to rotate the patient's head. So checking for neck mobility and lack of a significant head trimmer is very important. The patient should also be cooperative. When working in such a small space, there is little safety net for sudden head movement, saccade, cough, et cetera. So you really need a good patient or you need to modify your, your anesthesia. It's also ideal to be able to visualize the angle in clinic. You need to identify important landmarks, ensure the intended procedure is possible, and potentially modify your technique. This is not an absolute, as the angle often widens post phaco and so you could still do MIG surgery, but it's important to know what you're getting into. There are several steps you can take as the surgeon prior to doing your first case that will prepare you for surgical success. I think gonio in clinic is crucial, not just for your surgical evals, but really for as many patients as you can. Comfortability with angle anatomy will serve you well in the OR. If you're not used to doing gonioscopy in clinic, you really should not be attempting intraoperative gonioscopy. 
Along the same lines, you need to know your landmarks cold. Intraoperatively is not the time to be figuring out whether you're looking at trabecular meshwork or scleral spur, ciliary body, et cetera. Um, so really know your landmarks cold. Gonioscopy.org is a really awesome resource that was uh, designed and created by Dr. Lee Allward at the University of Iowa, and it's a great way to learn or improve your gonioscopy skills. And then lastly, intraoperative practice. You'll see that hand positioning and stability are very different in FACO, which is shown on the right, versus gonioscopy or MIGS, which is shown on the left. Your elbows are going to be more extended than they usually are, and you'll be likely sitting a little further away from the patient than usual. You will be working under bimanual conditions by obligation with the gonio in your non-dominant hand. I recommend before you start gonioscopy, or before you start a MIG surgery, that you do intraoperative gonioscopy multiple times. You can do this before or after FACO or any other sort of eye surgery. Just go ahead and try and visualize the angle, and you can even take a small hook or a cannula and navigate over to the angle and get used to working within that space. As you might guess, it's safer to do this after FACO when the lens is already out and the angle is a little deeper. Anesthesia choice is worth discussing. The vast majority of MIGs can be performed topically, resulting in faster patient recovery. So it's very nice to be able to do that. However, keep in mind a retrobulbar block is good for beginners. You can assure that the eye is going to be more stable. And I also think it's nice for 360 degree cannulation procedures, which can sometimes be a little more uncomfortable for the patient than your focal nasal work. It is possible, though, with a retrobulbar block for the eye to rest exotropic a little bit, and we'll get into a little bit later why that can be troublesome. Wound construction is just as important in MIGS as in any other procedure. It is your access to the eye and to the angle and it can really impact your view, your mobility, and your ergonomics. So before you make any incision, you must know the anatomy of your intended gonio lens. There are all kinds of different direct gonio lenses with different sorts of fixation rings, contact shapes, etc. And this might impact where you place your wound. So you want to be cognizant so you can avoid bumping into your lens with the instrument. Make sure your incision is pointed towards the targeted angle, especially a paracentesis. It's not always going to be radial. Sometimes you're going to want to point it right towards the nasal angle. And for most procedures, you'll want to center your main wound temporally to target the nasal angle. This will maximize your range of movement. So here, if this is a temporal incision, you're going to only be able to work so much within this incision. And so you want it to be centered on, your, on the area you intend to work in. You also want to take care to avoid limbal vessels. If you're too posterior, you'll run into bleeding that will cause trouble throughout the case, and we'll touch more on that in a little bit. I think it's best in general to go for the smallest workable incision that you can. That way you have less loss of OVD. But an incision that's too small makes it hard to get in, in and out, and you can get locked in the wound. So finding the right balance is important. Once you know your lens and you have your wounds, you must move the patient and microscope to get a view. The way you do that is you're going to rotate the microscope about 35 to 40 degrees away, or excuse me, towards the surgeon. This can be done by the circulator. The circulator can also tilt the oculars up for you, as you'll see is necessary in this picture. While this is happening, you want to turn the patient's head away from you, 35 to 40 degrees, and you're going to ask the patient to look straight ahead. Again, I urge you not to be shy about turning the patient's head away from you. This is crucial. The ultimate goal of this repositioning is to get coaxial light entering parallel to the iris, pointing into the angle. This will help you best achieve an on foss view. So as soon as you put the lens down, you're going to have to be looking for landmarks, and there are a few helpful ways to quickly identify the trabecular meshwork. You can look for pigmentation. A lot of elderly patients have nice pigmentation, and you're also going to be targeting areas of pigment in some procedures, so this is a nice um, landmark to look for. 
Some patients will have blood visible in Schlimm's canal, and this typically occurs when pressure is on the lower side. Another really nice way to visualize TM is tripan blue. This was described in JCRS by Parker et al. in 2017. And all you have to do is inject tripan and leave it in for about 30 seconds. You rinse it out and proceed as usual and you'll get a nice blue staining of trabecular meshwork. That way you have no question as to where you're working. Awareness of landmarks is crucial not only for success but also for avoiding complications. Just to remind you of the area you are working in. We all know the average AC is around three millimeters, but the distance from the anterior TM to the posterior TM is anywhere from 575 to 800 microns. And another measure that is commonly used is angle opening distance. This is a measure from you know, 500 millimeters or 500 microns forward from scleral spur down to the iris. And that is on average in a normal eye around 300 microns and it gets even smaller, smaller in narrow angles. Nearby vulnerable structures include the iris and ciliary body. This picture shows a small iridodialysis next to an eye stent, and we've seen multiple cyclodialysis clefts referred in after gonio surgery. Decimase membrane, decimase membrane can easily be nicked. Posterior wall of Schlimm's canal, which is less crucial, but it can still be damaged. And then of course, lens and zonules are there if you're working in a fakic eye. So once you'll get, you're, you're getting started, you'll inevitably encounter issues. It's part of learning, but the ability to troubleshoot will save you. If you don't have a skilled teacher at your side, it can be very hard to identify in real time exactly what you're doing wrong. Corneal folds are a common factor that will impair your view. They occur in three situations. Either the IOP is too low, and in this situation you can add OVD, Co cohesive OBD is nice, it creates space, but it does burp easily. So you'll wanna check your wounds and a dispersive OBD plug can be used at the wound to hold in your, your cohesive OBD. Your gonio pressure may be too high. It's really easy to do this in the beginning because you're, you're, it's hard to think about both hands at the same time and you're trying to manipulate the eye to get it to do what you want. But go ahead and check your positioning and try and lighten your touch. And then third, you can also have tension on the wound. So when you're working in a wound, if you're putting tension on it, you're gonna create corneal folds. So try and relax your tension and reposition. I have a nice video to illustrate this point. You'll see I have a beautifully clear view here in the beginning with nice pigmented TM. I'm going in with an eye stint here. This is early, early, probably even in residency, and engaging trabecular meshwork. And I'm laterally translating in the wound until I run into the wound edge, and you'll see then I have a bunch of corneal striae in my way, because there I am at the edge of my wound. To avoid this, I should instead treat the wound as a fulcrum, rotating the base of the instrument right as I work to the left. Another very common problem is a top-down view or under rotation. You may notice when this happens that you feel like you can't quite see into the angle. It's as though the posterior, posterior cornea is blocking your view. And the risk of operating under this condition is misjudgment of angle anatomy, decimase injury, because you're right there by cornea, or difficulty with stent placement, which is crucial for, um, you have to have an on fast view for stent placement. Solutions for this are to rotate, rotate the head further away from you or rotate the scope more towards you. In a pinch, you can have the patient look away and we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more about this. I have a video showing how easy it is to under rotate here. The gonio lens is going on everything's looking good, and it almost looks like this patient just has an entirely non-pigmented angle. But fortunately, we're able to recognize the problem. We know that there's pigment there from our in-clinic assessment. And so we move the scope more towards the surgeon, and then also rotate the head a little further away 
and you can see now our view is dramatically better and there's actually quite a lot of pigment in this patient's trabecular meshwork. This is early on, so I'm going in with a Sinsky hook to just kind of navigate the angle a little bit and get used to working in that space. Like I mentioned earlier, in a pinch, you can ask the patient to look away for you, but I will caution you in doing this as it's very hard for patients to maintain this position of gaze, especially if they're mildly sedated for surgery they tend to get endpoint nystagmus, which is no doubt suboptimal for gonio surgery. So you can see that fine nystagmus here as that patient's trying their best to help you out. One of the most frustrating issues with gonio surgery is blood. You can have blood on the front of the lens or dried OVD or even water. Any of those things can degrade your view. The front of the lens must be dry. You can also get blood between the cornea and the lens. This is frustrating because it's usually from limbal bleeding, um, but you really just have to rinse and you can try and tamponade the area of bleeding and you rinse and add more OVD to continue to maintain your view. And then you can of course get blood in the anterior chamber. Blood in the AC is actually nearly unavoidable. In fact, reflux with gonio surgery and MIGS is normal. A well-targeted goniotomy or stent, if connected to the venous system like it should be, will bleed. But as we all know, time in the angle is, is your view. So the longer you're there, the, the rapid, more rapid your view is going to decline. So in order to minimize bleeding, I would encourage you to act with intention partially incising TM and then backing out or hesitating or bumping around in the angle is not what you want to do. If you do encounter blood though, you can add OVD, which usually clears the view and helps tamponade things a little bit, but you can move the blood out of your way. I encourage you to move it to the side and not to mid AC because it's still going to be blocking your view. If all of this is still failing, you can wash out the AC and replace the OVD, but fortunately this is rarely necessary. I've got a video to illustrate all the fun you can have with blood and how important it is to manage heme. So you'll see it looks like a good incision, but pretty rapidly you can tell that we're a little too posterior. Now blood is seeping onto the cornea and mixing in the OVD that we've put on the eye to couple. The view initially is okay. The surgeon's using a Kahook dual blade here to do a goniotomy. But pretty quickly, you're getting blood under the lens, between the lens and the cornea. We're doing the rinse and repeat option, but again, rapidly accumulates. And now there's blood on the back of the lens as well. So you got to rinse the cornea, but you also have to rinse the back of the lens. And once we do that, the view is once again good, but probably not long. So if your view is still, still blurry after all of this, it could be that you're too zoomed out. Gonio surgery takes a fair amount of zoom, so really try and get zoomed in enough like you feel you're in the angle and can really see things well. I found that gonio surgery really triggers my accommodation as a young surgeon. It's a lot of zooming in and zooming out and focusing up and focusing down so you can really get an accommodative spasm. So if you feel like you really just can't see no matter what you're doing, take a moment and look away from the microscope. Patients with a lot of conjunctival chalasis can give you trouble because the chalasis will come up onto the cornea and can get in the way between the lens and the cornea and can block your view. As eye surgeons, we all know that bubbles are the enemy and also corneal edema can really cause trouble when you're trying to do angle surgery. This brings me to, my, to the next point and a question of when to do mix. Should you do it before or after FACA when you're pairing the two? I think doing it before when the cornea is clear, the patient's less wiggly, and you have a physiologic globe with the lens still in place, those are all beneficial things. But the downsides of doing it before, you can hit the lens and you might have a phacomorphic view. The opposite is true for doing surgery after. And I think if you're, you're new, excuse me, I think if you're new to angle surgery, it's best to do this after, after the FACO because the angle's more open and it's just a little bit safer.
All right, we're quickly going to switch gears to review indirect gonioscopy. Indirect lenses are, are mirrors or prisms used to reflect light from the angle so that it leaves the eye perpendicular to the face of the contact lens and towards the examiner. This is what you're used to from clinic. This is an Ahmed Gonio lens. We use this a lot here at Kellogg. And it's a really helpful indirect lens as it has a handle that conveniently rotates 360 degrees around the lens. So you can hold the handle still while twisting the lens or you can move the handle while you're holding the lens still um, and switch hands that way. But non-handle lenses work just as well. Major differences between indirect and direct gonioscopy, again, there's no need to rotate the head, which is really nice. And you can work in primary while viewing the angle, so you can quickly pop the lens off and on and get a good view. You are, however, working with mirrors, so it takes a little time to get used to that reverse action. And then common uses for indirect gonioscopy, we use that here for um, ab interno zen implantation, for goniosynechiolysis, cleft repair, quick looks at the angle off and on while you're working. And then a general view of the superior, inferior, and temporal angle. Maybe you're doing FACO and you wanna look and see if you, there's a residual lens fragment or something like that. Gonioscopy, uh, indirect gonioscopy can be really quick and easy for that. When you are using the indirect lens, make sure your focus, centration, and light are over the mirrored part, not the contact part, or else things won't seem like they're in focus. Here in this picture, you can easily see the superior angle with the zen that has been implanted. The head of the patient is straight on in this situation and the eye is in primary. And we could easily twist the gonio lens 360 degrees to look at the angle. This is a video of goniosynechiolysis. Again, we're looking at the superior angle and you can see the PAS right here. There are lots of ways to lyse synechia. You can use microforceps or a cannula, but here, because this is after FACO and we've already got it open, we're using the IA and you can just tip down gently, aspirate a little portion of the, the iris. You wanna be gentle again with this so as not to induce too, too much inflammation but you can just aspirate the iris a little bit and gently pull free those synechiae. And you'll see there those peripheral anterior synechiae are lysed now. Okay, for part two, we'll talk about tips on individual MIGs. But I do want to start again with a poll question. So what is your current level of experience with MIGS this time? Not so much gonioscopy, but MIGS. Do you have no experience? A few cases? Are you proficient, but you could improve? Or are you skilled and could teach? Okay, so the vast majority of you have no experience. So I want to start pretty basic. I think this is really helpful. The AGFs, AGS, American Glaucoma Society, and the US FDA came together to set up a definition for MIGS, and they determined that all MIGS should include the following. They should lower IOP via an outflow mechanism. They should be done either ab interno or ab externo. They should have limited or no scleral dissection, and then minimal or no conjunctival manipulation. So just to check your understanding of MIGS in general, which MIGS, if you had to categorize them, have an IOP safety net due to episcleral venous pressure and are therefore less likely to cause hypotony? Trabecular bypass type surgeries, suprachoroidal shunts, subconjunctival shunts, all of the above or none of the above. Good, so about half of you got it right. It's the trabecular bypass type surgeries. About 30% answered subconjunctival shunts, so we'll chat a little bit about that. So the same AGS FDA working group also categorized MIGS by the recipient outflow reservoir, which has a significant influence on both safety and efficacy for MIGS. They categorize them as Schlimm's canal. These are the ones that have a lower risk of hypotony. This is because they still rely on the physiologic outflow um, system. Along those same lines, they have efficacy limitations. Their success does depend on patency of the distal outflow system. 
And for the same reason, as we've already discussed, they have an increased safety profile. So they have less hypotony due to limitation of low pressure by episcleral venous pressure. Suprachoroidal and subconjunctival MIGs are non-physiologic and theoretically more efficacious for this reason. But this also comes with an increased risk and pos uh, in increased risk of hypotony and the possibility of disuse atrophy of the physiologic outflow system. Subconjunctival procedures also carry the risk of infection because they do cause a, they do form a filtering bleb. Currently in the US, we have no access to suprachoroidal shunts, so I won't be able to comment on this today. I don't have any experience using these. And because of variability in global access to subconjunctival stents, and for the sake of time, I won't be able to dive into subconjunctival stents. But I will say I'm very impressed by Zen and excited about preliminary results for InFocus. And there's a lot online about these procedures that you, have, you can access. I will spend the rest of the talk diving into Schlem's Canal uh, type procedures, especially my personal favorites, goniotomy, and trabeculotomy. I think these procedures are perfect for a global webinar as they require nothing more than tools typically found in the OR. Stents, again, may or may not be available where you are, but given their popularity as quote unquote starter MIGs um, and their excellent safety profile, I will give a few tips on these surgeries. There are innumerable videos on how you can do each step for each pr procedure, so I will try to stick mostly to just tips that you might not find elsewhere online. Once you've, dis once you've cleared the patient for direct gonio, patient selection is crucial for deciding exactly which mix procedure you will do. Schlem's canal stints are most appropriate for mild to moderate glaucoma. These patients should have an IOP target of mid to high teens. In the vast majority of studies, including the COMPARE trial, which looked at eye stent versus hydrus as a standalone procedure, patients end up around 17 millimeters of mercury on average. They often require fewer meds afterwards, which is a huge benefit, especially if you're, there are access to medication issues or compliance issues. And in general, patients are okay to stay on their blood thinners. But if they are on a prophylactic aspirin, I would recommend that they stop it just because I've seen a few hyphemas after stints. Over on the right, you'll see the first generation eye stent on the top. The body of the stent is placed in Schlem's canal and the snorkel is what is accessing the AC. The inject is in the middle. This is a second generation glucose product. And these are small dart-like stents that are injected into the TM in two locations. And then on the bottom is the hydra stent, which encompasses about three clock hours of Schlem's canal. And it has one inlet you'll see here and a, and a mechanism of dilation along its length. I have a video that just shows a routine first generation eye stent. This is courtesy of Manjul Shaw, one of my mentors. You'll see that he's approaching the angle at about a 15 degree tip up configuration and then flattening out to stay in Schlem's canal. This is an eye stent to the left and then slowly releasing and kind of tapping the stent into place. And then fast forward, we're gonna to go to the other side, this eye stent to the right, same approach and leveling out once in canal and you'll see some reflux heme. It's also important to approach the trabecular mesh work at about a 30 degree angle so you properly engage canal and avoid superficial implantation. With iStent Inject, there is a trocar that is placed into the trabecular meshwork. And the tube of the inserter is used to dimple down into TM. And once this is done, you click the button and it inserts a stent into TM. And then it's preloaded with two stents and you get four clicks. The same process, you're threading the trocar into the through, through TM, dimpling in with the injector, and then deploying the stents. For eye stent inject, it's crucial to have an on fast and zoomed in view so you can really see how well the trocar is lined up.
Additional tips, I've already mentioned the importance of an on foss angle view. You should try to target areas of pigment or heme reflux. And also for eye stents, I feel like it's really crucial to be decisive and not to linger in the angle. Again, the angle of approach is critical and it's a little different for each type of stent. If you're noticing resistance during implantation, you should stop and troubleshoot. You may be running into the posterior aspect of Schlem's canal or a stricture, or you may be actually just running into your wound like we've discussed before. And the other important thing to remember is viscoelastic is a device. So if your stent becomes dislodged, you can use OBD to kind of suspend the stent for reloading. And I'll show you a video of that in just a little bit. Here's an example of what happens when you have a top-down view or under rotation when you're trying to implant a stent. So I have no on foss view here. You can see the stent disappears under the cornea as I go out into the angle. And obviously implantation was unsuccessful here but recognizing the issue could have made this procedure uh, much easier. In this video, the inject has come off the guide wire and needs reloading. The surgeon can't quite get the inject back onto the trocar without some assistance from OBD. So what you can do is use some cohesive OBD to float that stent right into the position you want it to be so that you're looking straight down the lumen. And then you can easily thread the trocar back through the stent and you'll be able to inject it. I don't have great videos of hydrus yet because I'm still working on learning this one, but this is a, but so far what we've learned that is not anywhere in the manual or that I've seen online is that hydrus is really finicky when it comes to angle of approach. So as you'll see in the graphic, this is from the FDA manual. The hydrus really needs to be flat against TM. You don't want that 30 degree approach that you use for an eye scent. It has to be flat and really close and kind of snuggled up to trabecular meshwork because as you deploy it, you want the stent to follow the curve of the canal. If your angle of approach is too large, the stent will pop out the other side of the canal as shown here. This is, again, hydrus is nitinol. It has shape memory, so you need it to really be lined up so that it stays within canal for the full three clock hours. Otherwise, you lose about a clock hour of um, effect. So patient selection for goniotomy, trabeculotomy is similar, but there are a few key differences. Again, this is a similar population of mild to moderate glaucoma, but the IOP target might be slightly lower or the medication or disease burden slightly higher. That's sort of how I pick these patients. Blood thinners are an absolute contraindication for 360 procedures, but a relative contraindication in goniotomy. These TM TM excising procedures work really well in steroid-induced high pressure as they address the area we think is most affected by steroid-induced glaucoma, the trabecular meshwork. Similarly, they can be done in uveitics as they, these procedures really aren't that inflammatory. So a controlled uveitic, they often have an overlying steroid issue as well. And so they do really good with goniotomy, trabeculotomy type procedures. I will caution you in patients that are status post-vitrectomy they are at risk for spillover heme. So if these patients get a hyphema, it can go into the vitreous cavity and can cause prolonged visual recovery. Top photo here, you'll see a nice open goniotomy cleft, and then this is a Cahook dual blade. General basics for goniotomy is you're gonna create a temporal wound with a nasal target. It's direct gonio and an abinterno approach. You're making a nasal incision of the trabecular meshwork with a blade or a needle. And you're aiming to carve out about three clock hours of trabecular meshwork. I have a video of a basic routine cahook. Again, this can be the cahook dual blade or a needle. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but you can see the dual blade action that's meant to carve out the trabecular strip. And once you're in Schlem's canal, the goniotomy blade tends to wanna stay in the canal which is helpful. 
Sometimes you'll meet a little resistance and then break through a stricture as the surgeon just did there. And as far as tips go, again, you don't have to have a cohook dual blade. You can use a bent 25 gauge needle. This has been described. You can also use the heel of your goniotomy blade to lice peripheral anterior sinecae while you're in there. And when you're working in extremes of view, so when you get to the edge of your gonio view and you feel like the blade is running out of your view, I'd urge you to err with your tip up a little bit. That way, if you do slip and hit a structure, it's peripheral decimase and not the iris root or ciliary body. And if you're feeling greedy or lucky, you can actually bend the hub of the needle to increase your degrees of goniotomy. This is a 25 gauge needle and a hemostat is being used, a large bulky hemostat is being used to bend the tip of the 25 gauge needle. And when it's all said and done, this simulates the action of the cohook dual blade. You've got two cutting surfaces and a scooping action. But the tip of this needle is quite a bit sharper, it seems, than the cohook dual blade, so be very careful when you're using this technique. In this, in this video, you'll see what you're using the heel of the cohook dual blade to lice low PAS. Also note the surgeon's widening the inner osseum of the wound. This can help with range of motion. And you see right there, just gently using the heel to break some low PAS and scleral spurs much more visible. And so basics for your 360 degree procedure, similar but different. You're gonna have a temporal incision with a superior temporal and inferior temporal paracentesis. Again, it's direct gonio from an ab interno approach. And you're going to use, if you're going to use a suture, you're gonna melt the tip of a 5 proline with a hot temp cautery, or you can use a 4 nylon. This has also been described. The bulb, the purpose of the bulb is as you thread the suture, it won't back out on you. It sort of acts as a barb. And if you cannot cannulate for a full 360 degrees, you can pull the suture without, and, and do a partial goniotomy. I recommend you make a small nasal goniotomy to start. Then you're gonna cannulate, Schlim, cannulate or thread Schlem's canal for 360 degrees, and then rupture trabecular meshwork for 360 degrees. And you end up doing an OBD BSS exchange. You do this multiple times to prime the system and really push fluid out through the distal collector channels. On the left, you'll see Pretty zoomed in view of a 5 proline that, that has been melted. Getting the bulb the right size is crucial and this is an ideal example. You don't want it to be too large because you'll have a hard time threading the, the goniotomy, but you also don't want it to be too small because then it loses its purpose. On the right, you'll see that the, the curve of the suture is lined up perfectly to follow curve of canal. So you're gonna be threading to the left here, but this make sure this is lined up and make sure you have plenty of slack. This is a graphic taken from the original descriptive paper by Grove et al. And again, you're just gonna start by cannulating or threading the small goniotomy here. You're gonna thread for 360 degrees with this micro forcep until the other end of the suture emerges. You'll grab the distal end of the suture and you also grab with a forcep outside of the eye and you'll pull both ends of the sutures to cause 360 degree rupture of trabecular meshwork. Tips is make sure your pair is pointing to the work zone. Again, you want a small nasal, excuse me, back up. You want a small nasal goniotomy. It makes it easier to thread. And be sure you have slack before threading. This is an ideal size of a goniotomy. It's small, no wider than a 25 gauge needle or an MVR blade. That way your, your tip is not popping out as you're trying to, to thread the, the suture. And then as far as grab tips, it's really important to pick up the proline two millimeters behind the bulb with the very tip of your micro forceps. Mind decimase membrane while threading. And if you meet resistance, back up and try again. You can also pull it out and go the other way. Again, don't force it. You could be going into the suprachoroidal space. 
Here's a video that shows some grab tips. Here the surgeon grabs a little too far back, so they're correcting their, their grab. Sorry, the view is poor in this video, but they're trying to grab and the actual forceps are bumping into the back of the Wallace Schlimm's canal, so it's impeding them from threading the suture. There they're grabbing too far away, so they don't have the right vector forces. And then here, finally re-grabbing in a proper location and they're able to thread. In this video, the suture has popped out somewhere along the way, so we're grabbing each end and doing a partial goniotomy. And then we're going to line the suture up correctly. And start threading the other direction. First of all, my t I'm not grabbing right at the tip, so I'm bumping into the back of Schlimm's canal there. But finally able to cannulate and thread the suture. Again, when it comes around, you'll grab the other end and you'll complete another partial goniotomy to hopefully get that full 360 trabeculotomy. Postoperatively, a few tips. In the OR, as soon as you're done, as soon as you can get the drape up, I'd encourage you to sit the patient up. This allows any blood to settle out of the patient's view. You can leave some OVD in the eye if you're worried about bleeding. It'll keep the pressure a little bit higher and tamponade bleeding. I use steroid and antibiotic as usual. And postoperatively, if, if you're noticing early PAS or blood in the cleft or prolonged hyphema, you can add pilocarpine that can potentially help with um, scar tissue formation. And I'd urge you to be cautious with post-op IOP drops, because if IOP is too low, they're going to bleed. You're going to get back bleeding. But also, if IOP is too high, you don't want to cause further optic nerve damage. These are my references. And I'd like to thank several folks that helped me with either gonioscopy or learning MIG surgery along the way, and also Hunter for always encouraging me to do these webinars. I can take questions. So one interesting question that came in is the, um, the role of binocular vision during this technique. I think, I think binocular vision and stereopsis is crucial for MIG surgery. Um, I'd be curious to know if this surgeon does cataract surgery under monocular conditions. Um, I mean, it, I could imagine it would still be possible based on other cues, but I think it'd be much more difficult when you're navigating such a small space to be safe. Another question is, do you use MIGS for advanced glaucoma? There are a lot of studies out right now on, on this, and they can be used uh, for refractory glaucomas. But I think in general, we here use them for mild to moderate disease, patients that desire to be off a drop or two. Um, and we, we typically reserve advanced glaucoma for more traditional procedures or even your blood forming procedures. Another question, what is the biggest problem slash difficulty when you start MIGS? I think I touched on this a little bit, but really for me, it's getting, a, getting and maintaining a view with gonioscopy. It's so easy when you're starting out to be focusing on your dominant hand MIGS device when the other hand is pushing on the cornea, causing folds, or you're losing viscoelastic through your wound. So really practicing intraoperative gonioscopy and being cognizant of your non-dominant hand and what the gonio lens is doing is really important. So I think that's the biggest struggle when it comes to learning MIGS. We see, a, as a tertiary referral center at Kellogg, we see a lot of complications come through from MIGS surgeries. And so even though they're advertised as very safe and they can be very safe in skilled hands, they're not completely benign. So you've got to be really careful when you're working in the angle. There are a lot of structures that can be damaged. And then the, there was a question, the glaucomatous patient can get a relief after MIGS procedure, if yes, how? Um, I think that's a really good question because there are a lot of ways that MIGS can impact a patient's lifestyle. One, the, the recovery time after MIGS compared to traditional surgeries and the risk, the low, low, low risk of infection that you would assume only by going into the eye, those are both really important and much better with MIGS compared to traditional surgeries. A lot of our patients note the improvement in quality of life and the improvement in the way their ocular surface feels when they can get off just one or two drops from MIGS surgery. So even if their absolute pressure doesn't change a whole lot, 
but they're able to stop a medication that can make a really big impact on their life. And also, you know, if costs are an issue or access to medications are an issue, mixed procedures can work really well. There's a question, can the Zen gel stint be done ab externo from the conjunctiva into the AC? This, yes, there's a lot of buzz about this in the U.S. right now through the American Glaucoma Society email network. There are videos online about this and how you can learn to do this technique. I haven't myself done it. I really like the ab interno approach um, and I'm comfortable with the ab interno approach, but there are a lot of videos on the ab externo approach. And the main benefit and thought behind this is making sure the tip of the subconjunctival tip of the stent is in the proper location. And okay, so in which cases do you still prefer trabeculectomy? This is an awesome question because trabeculectomy is still alive and well. I think in your patients that really truly need a low pressure, uh, pressure under 12, under 10, there is no MIGS procedure at this time that I've been able to use that achieves those low pressure targets. So even in your comparative trials of Zen versus Trab with your um, which their outcomes were similar, you still really, if you need a patient as low as under 10, you can only get there with trabeculectomy. Oh yes, a question again on the suture material for GAT or the 360 degree trabeculotomy. We use 5O proline, but there are also reports of using 4O nylon, so either of those sutures. What is the difference between minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries and microinvasive glaucoma surgeries? I don't think there's any difference. I think it's just semantics and the way different people say it. But technically the term here is minimally invasive. How do we manage hypotony after MIG surgery? Typically hypotony after MIG surgery is rare, um, especially in your, your canal-based procedures, so the ones that follow your physiologic outflow. Hypotony is very rare and usually self-limited. Um, a lot of times these patients were on a ton of meds before they went into surgery, and so once those meds wash out, pressure picks up. And even if they are hypotenous, it's usually of little consequence. They might get a little more bleeding than usual. Um, in your, your filtering surgeries, like the Zen that I have experience with, they often are hypotenous early, but it's not a clinically significant hypotony. Um, like you get with trabeculectomy. So I, I think it's the more controlled outflow that you get through the Zen stent, but they tend, you know, even if they have a pressure of five or six, the, the chamber is still deep and they don't have choroidals or hypotony maculopathy. Any special instruments for MIGS, especially in low resource settings? That's the primary reason I focused on goniotomy and trabeculotomy. Those can be done with a bent needle or a, a melted tip proline or nylon. You do need, for GAT, you do need micro forceps. So you'll need some sort of forceps that can access the nasal angle from the temporal approach. That's the only special instrument that you should really need. A lot, there's a lot of description of using a light, lighted microcatheter for GAT, but you really don't have to have that. I actually prefer the 5 proline. Can MIGS be used in glaucoma post-op vitreoretinal surgery? Yes. I did mention that I would caution you in doing this. In the, in the post vitrectomy eye, globe compliance is a little less um, or a little more. And if you get a heme, if you get hyphema after surgery or during surgery, it can spill over into the vitreous cavity and you can have prolonged visual recovery. So that is the risk and the downside. So in general, I try to avoid um, trabeculotomy, goniotomy in these patients, but a stenting procedure would be, I think, fine. Is express shunt a MIGS? So good question. I think it falls outside the category of MIGS, at least the, the classification established by the AGS and FDA because there is conj dissection and there is a scleral flap that's created, which um, you should not be doing scleral flap dissection or major conjunctival manipulation. So this is a question, it sounds like it's an individual patient. Would you use um, MIGS for ocular hypertension with a cup to disc ratio of 0.4 in the right and 0.1 in the left with average IOP of 32 and a patient not using drops reliably? Um, without seeing more data, I would say it sounds like going into this case that you could use MIGS for this patient. It doesn't sound like they have much disease burden although we need to see a field um, and know more about them, but I think this could be a, an appropriate patient for MIGS. Can we use Kahook in pediatric glaucoma? I don't have much experience with pediatric glaucoma, though we know goniotomy is like the 
primary procedure for primary congenital glaucoma, so I don't see why a cohoc dual blade couldn't be used as opposed to a needle. But I, I can't comment on that for sure because I don't do pediatric glaucoma. And then what about long-term output with mix? I don't know if you could clarify your question. I don't know if you mean long-term outcomes. I think the data we have so far goes out to two years in most, most cases, and the, the data is decent. It's, it reflects what early outcomes are. Then we had one more question. What is the incidence of cystoid macular edema with MIGS? I don't have a number for this off the top of my head. So often it's paired with cataract surgery, so I'd say it's similar to, to post-FACO CME. Um, I have only seen one case of cystoid macular edema after a Zen, um, and, and most of these procedures, like I said, are minimally inflammatory. So uh, I, would, I would hypothesize that the macular edema is coming more from the FACO than from anything. Of course, if you're hitting iris, that's a different story because you're releasing a lot of inflammatory mediators that way. But a well-performed mixed procedure, I would say cystoid macular edema overall is very rare. 